Um, hello? I just want to point out, some of you might have a little bit of trouble understanding my accent. That's because I'm English. Okay, when I was young, my parents would always say to me, when you grow up, you can do anything you want to do. You can be anything you want to be. And I'd say, what, really, anything? And they'd say, yeah, you could be anything. All you've got to do is practice. Now, eventually I realized no amount of practice was ever going to make me a long-tailed macaque, or a chimpanzee, or an orangutan. But I also realized a few other things. I realized the steps you need to take in order to get good at something. And I narrowed this down to kind of six steps, and then I've applied this to every aspect of my life. Would you like to hear my six steps? Okay. There's a certain amount of audience participation that goes on here. And I'm up here for 18 minutes, and if you're not participating, it, it might get a bit strange. Would you like to hear my six steps? Yeah. That's much better. All right, step one, getting good at things. In order to get good at things, you need to want to be good at things. It seems really simple, but it's actually a lot harder than you think. And we're going to come back to that. Okay, step two, you need to learn your craft. You need to understand it and you need to practice. Step three, you need to start practicing more than you're already practicing. Step four is about realization. You need to realize that if at any point you stop practicing, you're not gonna get better. In fact, quite quickly you're gonna get a lot worse. Step five goes the other way. Step five says that if you've reached a point where you're actually quite good at something, you need to stay humble. You need to realize that you're not the best in the world, and you're never going to be. There's always going to be someone who's better than you. Even the world champion knows there will always be a new world champion. Step six. Now, a lot of people find this one the hardest. Step six, you need to listen to other people. You need to listen to their advice, you need to listen to their criticism, and you need to listen to their opinions. And the reason a lot of people find this the hardest is if you've invested a lot of time into something that you really want to be good at, if you've practiced a lot and you've reached a stage where you're ready to show someone else and they respond by going, yeah, it's all right. That could be heartbreaking. It can be soul destroying. But if you ever want to get any better, you need to realize you need to start listening. And in order to do that, you've got to do a few things. Firstly, you've not got to be precious about your ideas or about what you're doing. Secondly, you need to realize that everybody's opinion has value. Absolutely everyone. And what you also need to do is you need to understand that an idea is something that can grow. And the best way to make it grow is to expose it to another idea. All right, I want to go back to step one. The simple idea that in order to get good at things, you need to want to be good at things. Now, when I was back home in England, I used to work with a lot of what got referred to as disenfranchised youth, hard to reach young people. And one of the biggest problems that we'd always face when you're working with this kind of person is just the enormous level of apathy that they would display. A lot of these kids, it seemed like they didn't care. They didn't want to be good. Now, there was an idea that got talked about quite a lot a little while ago. And what this idea said that is perhaps this increased level of apathy is actually related to the boom in social networking websites. You see, what all these websites let us do is they let us build like a virtual personality, a virtual identity that we control, that we edit. And the thing with this is we all know kids want to be popular. We all know they want to be cool. And what these websites offer, what they all have in common is the accumulation of friends you just add friends. It's as simple as a click of a button. And what we quite often find is that some of the kids that were the most apathetic young people, these were the kids that had hundreds and hundreds of online friends. Friends that they'd communicate with by typing messages or chatting or poking or posting videos or photographs, and most of all, clicking the little like button. And then in return, they'd be liked back. Now, what this idea says is that perhaps all this increased social internet activity 
it actually creates this sense of false popularity, this virtual call. And now, one of the biggest problems that you always face with these kids, their apathy, it derives from that. It derives from this, this virtual popularity. You see, if you've reached a level of popularity where you've put yourself up here on a pedestal, then the risk of failure is enormous. It's a lot easier for them than it was when I was young. See, if I wanted to be popular now, I could get a video from uh, YouTube, I could post it on my Facebook wall. If I had five people like it, and one person say, hey, cool video, then I've done it. I'm popular. It took me about a minute. See, when I was 15, if you wanted to be popular, you actually had to do something. You had to talk to people, face to face. And you'd get to know them, and they'd get to know you. And slowly, you'd become friends. And if you wanted to be held in some kind of esteem, you needed to devote a lot of time to something. You needed to be dedicated. Maybe it was sports, or music, or free running, or playing the guitar, or whatever it was. But the key to it was that you wanted it, and that you tried. And you see, for these kids, because their popularity is achieved in under a minute, why would they want to be good at anything? Now, one area where this becomes a real big problem is in terms of communication and social interaction. You see, these kids, they might be great at typing messages and clicking buttons, but if you got 10 of them and put them in a room together, I'm pretty sure you'd struggle to get a dialogue. You'd struggle to get a discussion, and you'd really struggle to get them to tell you what they actually like and what they're passionate about. Okay. So, this is it then. Why are they like this? And the idea is that perhaps this virtual popularity has placed them on this pedestal. And now, there's a big risk of failure, especially if they're trying something new for the first time. Anything that might take any amount of practice or anything that might be difficult. You see, for these kids, their fear of being embarrassed is enormous. Their fear of not being successful, of exposing themselves as not being cool. And this fear of being embarrassed is starting to outweigh the desire to be good at things. Now, I'm not completely sure that this idea is 100% true. I'm not sure it's completely accurate. But I can see a lot of truth within it. I first came to Bali about three months ago. And I came out on a short holiday with my girlfriend, and we toured all around the island. One place we went was Kuta Beach. Now, on Kuta Beach, we were sat there watching all the surfing, and my girlfriend said to me, hey, you like trying stuff. Why don't you try surfing? And my immediate reaction is I turned to her and I said, nah, I'm not really into surfing. You see, what was going on is that in the back of my mind, my brain was telling me, you're 31 years old. You are much too old to be bad at something. And for me, this fear of embarrassing myself, this fear of failure, it outweighed my desire to have fun and to try something new. Now, this is always, always the case with these kids. And it always comes down to this, them trying it for the first time, getting them to step outside of their comfort zone. Let's just talk about the first time for a minute. Now, I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that nobody here had a good first time. Nobody's first time went according to plan. Thankfully, it also didn't last very long. And hopefully not too many people were watching. And more to the point, you got it out the way. You got past the stigma. And after that, you can only improve. Now, between the age of about 15 and 25, I always had this same poster on my bedroom wall. And it was a poster my mum had given me. It was a Samuel Beckett quote. It said, try, fail. Try again, fail again. Fail better. Now, this rule of first times, it applies to most people. But with, av with every rule, there is an exception. And in this case, the exception was my friend Ash. Now, Ash's first time was magnificent. For Ash, every first time was magnificent. Whatever it was, basketball, gymnastics, websites, uh, 
quantum mechanics, Sudoku, mowing the lawn, playing golf, water polo, whatever it was, Ash was pretty good the first time. And I think the secret to Ash's success was the fact that he was never embarrassed. He was never afraid of what people might think if he couldn't succeed the first time. Okay. Um, I'm just going to have a little quick look at my piece of paper here. Because this is actually the first time I've been at TED. And um, I'm going to try and not be embarrassed about the fact that I'm not going to do as perfectly as I hoped I would. Oh, I love getting applause for doing it wrong. <laughs> you see, my personal belief is that this fear of being embarrassed is really holding us back, holding us all back as individuals. And the thing is that we live in an amazing world. And at the minute, too many people are content to be average. Now, what is it? Embarrassment. I actually went online and I got this from Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia, if you don't know, that's a website. You can write that down, have a look, it might help you out. Embarrassment is an emotional state experienced upon having a socially or professionally unacceptable act or condition witnessed by or revealed to others. Usually, some amount of loss of honor or loss of dignity is involved. Now, I'm in no way endorsing Wikipedia as a reliable source of information. But what I am saying is that they're kind of on the money with this bit about loss of dignity, loss of honor, or out here in Asia, we call it loss of face. I'm currently working at a university in Cambodia, and one of the biggest problems I have there is loss of face. I quite often ask a room full of students, do you all understand? And the answer is invariably, yes, teacher, we understand. Even when they don't. And see, for a lot of these kids, they're actually more afraid of exposing their lack of knowledge than they are about admitting they just don't get it. And again, it all stems back to this fear, the fear of being embarrassed. So I want to talk about the fear for a minute. Now, I actually did a little bit of independent research on the, the symptoms of the fear a short time ago. And by independent research, what I mean is I got five or six people I knew together, and I just asked them. And I used an example of public speaking. I said, what are the symptoms of the fear when, you use, when you're public speaking? Now, I doubt the results are ever going to get published, but one thing that did come to light was that it was a very physical thing. A lot of shaking, red face, dry mouth, accelerated speech, and just, just awkward self-doubt. Now, there's several ways that we can handle this fear, several accepted ways. The first one is obviously avoidance. Just don't put yourself in that situation. Don't ever talk to large groups of people. In fact, don't talk to small groups of people, or even to people. And don't go where people are. Don't go to bus stops, or swimming pools, or shopping centers, or, or anywhere. In fact, stay in your house, close your doors, shut your curtains, and don't look in the mirror, because there's a person in there. <laughs> Obviously, this isn't the best way. I think you're much better off trying to face your fear. Now, one way I was always told that you could do this in regards to speaking to big groups of people was that if you're nervous about talking in front of people, you should imagine that your audience is naked. Just quickly, everyone have a look around the room, look to your right, look to your left, look at the people behind you and in front of you. Bear in mind, I can see you and I know if you're looking around the room. Just look at all these people in here. Now imagine them naked. For me, this doesn't work. And the main reason it doesn't work, well, there's two main reasons. Firstly, my mind hasn't reached a point where I can create detailed hallucinations that I just paste over reality. And secondly, I tend to get distracted when I think about naked people. But you see, the seed of this idea, the seed, the very root of this idea is gold. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to displace our embarrassment. We're trying to put our embarrassment onto someone else. I want to tell you about my dad. For the whole of his life, my dad was never what, was, what anyone would have considered to be an attractive man. What he was, was very confident in his appearance, very comfortable. So comfortable, in fact, that he spent most of his adult life dressed just in a pair of pants and a bandana. 
And quickly, by pants, I mean the English interpretation where pants means pants, not the American where pants means trousers. I'm talking about my dad's underwear. Now, my dad spent most of his days dressed just in his underwear and a bandana. And what this did is it had an incredible knock-on effect. My dad had absolutely no shame. In fact, his lack of embarrassment actually made other people embarrassed. <laughs> I remember quite often, as a kid on a Saturday morning, there'd be a knock on the front door, and you'd look out the window and it'd be the milkman. And the milkman stood there and he's holding the bill. And my dad had answered the door in the same way, swing it wide open, stand with his hands on his hips, just his pants, and do this. Now that milkman, he'd crumble. He never gave my dad that bill. In fact, it always ended up in a milk bottle on Monday morning. You see, my dad's lack of embarrassment made other people embarrassed. And he achieved this by embarrassing himself. So maybe this is it. Maybe this is the cure for being embarrassed. We need to intentionally embarrass ourselves as often as possible. And as teachers and as parents, we also need to take a certain amount of responsibility for the young people in our care. And we need to do our best to embarrass them as well. I'm not saying this in a malicious way. We need to do it gently. We need to ease them into it and show them that it's nothing to be afraid of. And then maybe, just maybe, we can start to fill this amazing world with people that want to be amazing. My name's John Berkovich. I'll be kicking around for a bit. If you see me, feel free, don't be afraid. Don't be embarrassed. Come over and have a chat. I'd like to hear what you think. Thanks a lot.